All right, at this time, we're going to move the Fisheries Management Committee. I'm going to ask Jim Bledsoe, Chairman. <laughs> Thank you, Chairman McMillan. Uh, I'm Jim Bledsoe, Chairman of the Fisheries Committee, and I'd like to call up Bobby Wilson, Chief of the Fisheries Division, to talk about the brook trout update. Thank you, uh, Commissioner Bledsoe. Every so often, we like to give a, an update or presentation to the Commission about programs that are within the Fisheries Division. Uh, most recently, we talked about the Florida bass We've talked about the, the lake sturgeon program and, and the muskie program. And today we're going to talk about the only native trout species in Tennessee, and that's the southern Appalachian strain of the brook trout in a far eastern part of our state. And uh, I'm going to introduce the speaker today. His name is Jim Habera. He's a Region 4 uh, fisheries biologist. And um, a little bit about Jim real quick. Over 20 years ago, we had a contract with the University of Tennessee at Knoxville to, uh, to with Jim as our main contact person to give us some information about the brook trout population in East Tennessee that we didn't know that much about. And so uh, Jim worked under contract with us for a number of years and uh, gave a couple of presentations to the commission. And finally, I think it was in the late 90s, um, he gave a presentation to the commission about a similar presentation that he's gonna give today, but this will be more updated. And uh, at the end of the presentation, our then Commissioner Tom Hensley said, why don't y'all just hire the boy? So, uh, so we did. And uh, so Jim's been working with us since what, about 1998, I believe, and, and I'm gonna let Jim take it from here. Thanks, Bobby, and thank you, commissioners, for the opportunity to, to share with you today the results of our recently completed Brook Trout Distribution Survey. Let me pull it up here. Okay, um, let's start by taking a look at why our brook trout resources are important to us and why we conduct these periodic distribution surveys. Well, as Bobby mentioned just a minute ago, they are our only native trout species, and as such, they've got significant roles in, first of all, ecological integrity. Uh, brook trout are the only fish that naturally occur in a lot of our headwater streams in the mountains and, and, and as such they're very important to the ecological functioning of those headwater stream systems. Uh, they're also important from a uh, perspective of biological diversity and genetic diversity, especially genetic diversity. Our native southern Appalachian brook trout here in Tennessee are considerably different genetically from brook trout populations farther north, say north of the New River watershed in Virginia. And, and even, even among our populations here in Tennessee, there is a substantial amount of, of genetic diversity. So we're very interested in, in conserving and, and maintaining that, uh, that diversity. And then finally, of course, they're a very important part of the sport fishing legacy of, uh, uh, of the mountain region where, they're, where they occur. So because of their importance to us, uh, ecologically and diversity-wise and so forth, and because of the threats that they face and have faced for, for a number of decades now, uh, like habitat loss through development and, uh, well, now climate change, of course, this, this is the native fish of Tennessee that probably or does really require the coldest water and probably the cleanest water as well. So uh, they face threats from, from habitat loss and from, uh, encroachment and displacement by na non-native trout species like rainbow and brown trout. So we periodically will do a comprehensive survey of all of our brook trout distribution out there in the eastern part of the state. So we know where these things stand and we, we know what actions that we would, might need to take uh, management wise. Uh, the first real comprehensive survey was done back in the late 70s and early 1980s by, by Rick Bivens uh, when he was a graduate student at UT. And he found about 93 miles of brook trout distribution in 73 streams, and that's outside of Great Smoky Mountains National Park. He also estimated that brook trout had lost at that time about 70 to 80 percent of their historic range in Tennessee, and, and he projected that they could possibly lose it all. They could be gone in, in 30 to 50 years. 
Moving forward about 15 to 20 years, I did the next brook trout distribution survey, and Bobby mentioned a little bit about this earlier, in the 1990s when I was a research associate at UT. And I found at that time 147 miles of, of brook trout distributed among 106 streams. And that included 71 of the 73 streams that Bivens recognized back in the late 70s, early 80s. So we'd only lost two brook trout populations in that interval of time. And they were relatively small, obscure populations anyway, so it wasn't a, a tremendous loss there. But the big change was, uh, the big increase in brook trout resource was related to uh, the 18 new or previously undocumented populations that I, that I found during the course of those surveys, and then 17 restoration projects that we were involved in with our partners in, uh, in the U.S. Forest Service and Trout Unlimited and the National Park Service. So again, we've, we've come forward another 15 to 20 years in some cases, and it's time to, to do another brook trout distribution survey. So I got this underway in, in 2011, and uh, the, uh, that survey included, again, only the streams. We're only talking about streams outside of the Smoky Mountains National Park, and that's basically the 10 counties uh, that are along the eastern border of Tennessee, along the North Carolina border. And basically what I did was went into those, in, into the 106 streams from the previous survey in the 1990s. That was our baseline set of streams that we looked at and identified the lower distributional limit of brook trout in each of those. And there were several other streams that had come to our attention too since the 1990 survey was completed that we looked at as well. And then we determined uh, changes relative to that 1990 survey, and in some cases back to, to Bivens survey in the late 70s and, uh, and early 80s. Okay, for those of you who haven't been over there, this is what brook trout habitat looks like from a higher vantage point, maybe not quite that 30,000 foot level, but a little bit lower. And this is what it looks like from ground level. And if you look really closely, you might be able to see some water down here in the lower, uh, lower left-hand corner. But uh, not all the streams are quite that bad. Sometimes you can even see 20 or 30 feet ahead of you there. But this is our standard distribution survey crew. We collect that data with backpack electrofishing gear. And uh, we either will get in at the last point where we knew brook trout occurred and then either move upstream or downstream until we encounter them or run out of brook trout and record those GPS coordinates, transfer that to some mapping software, and then we can calculate what the distribution change has been. So there's basically three outcomes. Uh, you can either the brook trout have receded upstream and lost distribution or they have uh, moved downstream and gained some some distribution or there's no change. And the basic res results look like this. We, uh, we actually lost 22.3 miles of distribution in a total of 46 streams and that includes 10, 10 streams or 10 populations that no longer exist. So um, those things are gone. Most of those streams were, were relatively minor brook trout populations uh, at lower elevations and marginal habitat. So there's not, um, those aren't, that's not as bad as it seems, but uh, you know, it's something that we're still concerned about. And interestingly, only two of those got uh, replaced by rainbow trout. The other ones, in the other cases, the, the trout was just gone there. And I believe it's probably because of, of environmental conditions. Uh, and I'll talk more about that a little bit later. We also gained 13 and a half miles of distribution in, in 35 other streams and had two recolonizations where brook trout actually moved down out of some tributaries into a main stem and recolonized that uh, where they had not been present back during the, the 1990s. There was no change in 26 streams, and the average losses uh, where distribution was lost was a half a mile per stream. Uh, average gain was about four tenths of a mile, a little bit less. So we, that comes out to a net change of a loss of about 8.8 .8 miles of, of distribution since the 1990s. Uh, we can look at that a little more closely where we lost distribution, and I'm 
breaking this down by watershed, and we basically have five where we have brook trout. Um, going from south to north, that would be the Little Tennessee, the French Broad, Nolichucky, Watauga, and South Holston. Uh, and interestingly, almost three-fourths of all of our losses in distribution occurred in the Watauga watershed. And that also included the stream where we lost, there was the, the single largest loss of distribution occurred, and that was 4.4 miles in, in Tiger Creek in Carter County. And the Watauga was also where we lost seven of 10 populations that we didn't relocate during this uh, recent survey. So not really sure what's, what's driving that. But uh, we know there's some really substantial floods in that watershed right at the end of the 1990s, and that could be part of it. Uh, and again, I'll talk about the, the effects of stream flows uh, in a moment. And uh, we can look at what I would consider to be the potential worst case scenario streams. And those are the ones that would be open to invasion. There's no sort of waterfall or cascade barrier there that would prevent other species of trout, rainbows or brown trout from moving in, and, uh, and they've also had no restoration or enhancement efforts. And in those cases, uh, we had 48 of those that, um, that we can look at, and they had a net loss of 9.1 miles or 13 percent since the 1990s, uh, and we can track 37 of those back to, they're also in common with, I should say, the, the survey from the 70s and 80s. And in, those, in that set of streams, the net loss was only 2.4 miles or 5%. So there's some distributional ebb and flow going on here, I'll call it. And, uh, and again, I'll mention that at the end in a little more detail. Uh, we can look at also the mean elevation where brook trout begin. And virtually no difference there, 2,768 feet in the 90s. And, uh, 27, 22 now, so they've actually moved down on average a little bit, uh, but that wouldn't be a significant change. And you can see by the, the bars there, the, those vertical bars, which, is, which represent the range, we still have brook trout populations that occur well below 2,000 feet. So those will be the ones that we'll want to watch in the future because they're in those marginal habitats where uh, they might be subjected to loss from, from any climate warming that we might experience. We have, of course, been doing some management with our brook trout populations since the 1990s, and, and here's, uh, here are the streams that, uh, that we have completed. Long Branch and the Nolichucky Watershed and, and Little Jacob Creek for restorations. And we actually use the native southern Appalachian fish to, to do those with now that we know where we have them. And then an enhancement project, and this one's actually ongoing. It's in Sycamore Creek down in the Teleco Watershed. And that started out as, as a, a restoration back in the 90s, and, and just in the past few years, we've extended that population all the way downstream to the dam near the uh, confluence with the Teleco River. And that's going to add another two and a half miles of brook trout habitat to, uh, to that stream. So overall, total restoration enhancements have added 3.6 miles to our, our brook trout resource. And also, uh, during our previous, or this recently completed survey, uh, we've identified three previously undocumented brook trout streams. So, taking everything together, I've got it broken down by watershed here, and you can see we, we currently know that we have out there on the landscape 103 brook trout streams now that add up to 142.3 miles of habitat. That's 96% of what we had back at the end of the 90s, uh, so a, a five mile or 4% loss. Uh, that's not as bad as I thought it might have been, but it's still a concern. You know, we wouldn't want to lose any brook trout habitat if we couldn't. And interestingly, if you look over here in this right-hand column, the only watershed where we had a net loss of distribution was that Watauga watershed. I mean, it was pretty substantial there, 12 and a half miles. We can also kind of focus a little farther down and just look at our native southern Appalachian brook trout populations. And we have 55 of those out there. That's about 53% of all of our brook trout streams or wild brook trout streams or populations. And the results are about the same. It's 96% of those uh, um, compared to what we had in the 90s in terms of stream length, and it's a 4% loss. 
over that time. And finally, just a historical perspective here of, of our brook trout distribution. Probably there's about 300 cold water streams over there uh, in the eastern end of the state that, that probably historically supported brook trout. Um, some research that I did going back through our files, our agency files, and some of the Forest Service records and, and so forth, I've, I was able to identify brook trout having been documented or, or listed as having occurred in 157 different streams. And as I mentioned, we, have, we currently know that we have them in 103 now, so brook trout are in about 66% uh, of the streams that we know they had occupied at one time in the past and 34% of their historic distribution. And if we look at that in terms of just stream miles, we generally use about 620 miles or 1,000 kilometers of cold water habitat that we have out there uh, outside the park. And we now have brook trout in 142. So that's about 23%. So somewhere between 20 and 30% of the historic habitat that brook trout once occupied still has them now. The rest is, is largely occupied by rainbows and or, or brown trout. So conclusions, uh, I talked about that ebb and flow earlier. It looks like the movements of the lower limits of brook trout distribution in, in many of our streams is likely transitional, uh, transitional changes, ebbs and flows that are linked to a host of factors interacting at a local scale, uh, especially stream flows. And a great, a great uh, example of that is Rocky Fork. And this is a, a, a stream in, in Greene County Unicoi in Greene County that we have a, a monitoring station on and have 23 years of data going back to 1991 there and you can see the effects of the different floods and droughts that we've had over time and when we get a substantial flood or high water event you can see that brook trout relative abundance in terms of biomass really drops off tends to favor the rainbows more under those higher flow conditions and then when we enter these drier periods like we had in the late 90s and early 2000s and again in 06 and 08 and probably 11 and 12 too, uh, that, that tends to favor brook trout abundance. They actually increase in abundance relative to rainbow trout. So if, uh, if you were to transpose that down to the lower end of a stream where the you know, brook trout distribution begins, just depends on which year you go in there and do a brook trout distribution survey, the brook trout may have you know, receded upstream or moved downstream some based on, on these uh, conditions. Uh, this also shows that, to me anyway, that brook trout can coexist with rainbows for quite a long period of time. This is over two decades worth of data. And when we started in 91, brook trout were about 40% of that uh, total population biomass out there. And in 2013, it was about 44%. Now, of course, it's fluctuated over time, but uh, there is a long-term equilibrium there, somewhere around 40 to 45%. So that's telling me that, uh, that most of these populations can coexist uh, with, with rainbow trout over a long period of time, provided that we don't get a whole lot of incidents like this 94 flood. And uh, fortunately, we haven't had that lately. So based on that, uh, we're probably going to lose some additional populations, especially where habitat's marginal, but, but brook, the brook trout resource is not likely to be lost in the next few decades like, uh, like we thought it was at one time back in the, in the 1980s. And uh, we're also now able to focus our future restoration efforts, say, for instance, in the Nolichucky watershed. We've got a few native southern popula or Appalachian populations of brook trout there, but they're not native to the Nolichucky watershed. They were introduced from the South Holston or Watauga. Um, we're going to work with the state of North Carolina and with Trout Unlimited to, uh, to get some fish. There are some native populations on the North Carolina side in that watershed. We're going to try to get one of those established uh, in a stream in, this, in the Nolichucky and then use that for some future restorations. And we may want to do some work in the Watauga since that's where we lost most of our, our brook trout distribution over the past 15 to 20 years. Uh, our management goal then could be no, basically a no net loss of brook trout distribution. And I think we can do that if we, 
you know, keep, keep in touch with uh, what's going on. Maybe, maybe what we can do is, is set up some distribution monitoring streams, a few in each watershed, and keep track of those maybe more frequent, frequently than every 15 to 20 years to, to keep in touch with what's going on, and, and that would help direct our, our management efforts in terms of uh, doing brook trout uh, restoration or enhancement work. Okay. Well, I'd like to acknowledge the folks that helped with the field work there. Of course, it couldn't be done without quite a bit of assistance. And uh, take any questions if, if you all have. <coughs> Thank you very much. Uh, is there any questions from the commission? I have a question or two. Uh, Jim, when I looked at that one slide, and it said we had like a hundred and something streams, but only a hundred, like just almost like it's averaged out about a mile per stream. Is that correct? Uh, it's <coughs> yeah, it's a little over a mile per stream. It's about two kilometers. Yeah, so that'd be just a little over a mile. And that's, you mean for a stream like the Rocky Fork that goes for? Oh, yeah. It's Cert just one mile. Certainly there are some that would be, you know, a few miles, mm -hmm. um, three or four miles. And then a lot of them are just, you know, is it less than a mile. Is it because the elevation that the streams are not that long themselves? Or, or is there just as you lower you get, the more pollution they can't uh, survive? Or yeah, what? a lot of them just aren't that long. These headwater streams, mm -hmm. you know, first and second order streams, some of them just aren't that long. And you know the brook trout typically don't go all the way to the end of where you know the, where you've got flow. Sometimes or, or a lot of times they'll be, you know they'll 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 begin somewhere down below that. Okay. I think there has to be a certain certain watershed size. The Forest Service folks like to say about 100 acres. It takes 100 acres of watershed drainage area to create a flow big enough to support a fish population like brook trout. So, so when y'all are stocking these fish. Uh, with your horseback stuff and all, I mean, do y'all pick out just the lower part of the of these streams, or do you go to the headwaters and spread them out, or just and hope they'll last that long? Well, we're not really stocking any except in like right now in Sycamore Creek. That's uh, that's the only one that we're doing, and, and we're doing the lower end of that, trying to get them reestablished down in that in that bigger habitat. Now, if we if we were to pick like this Nolichucky watershed, um, we've got a stream picked out there, and. Uh, we, we wouldn't go all the way up, you know, we'd want to get down far enough where you've got a good constant flow and enough habitat to, to support a population year-round. Sure. Appreciate you driving down and sharing that with oh, us. Yeah. Sure, glad to it, do it. Is any of our hatcheries capable of raising brook trout? Or I know you said we got some out of the Carolinas, but. Uh, we, we do, um, the Teleco, we've actually got a brook trout rearing facility down at the Teleco hatchery that we're using to produce southern Appalachian fish for that stream that's the tel or Sycamore Creek that's right there specifically for that project. Um, that can be used uh, to produce brook trout for other, you know, certainly other projects. This, this one in the Nolichucky is, in my opinion, a little bit different since we're going to get these fish from from next door in North Carolina. We, we've had problems keeping so, you know, wild fish at the hatcheries, and I'd hate to lose those fish <laughs> and have to go back to North Carolina with my hands. So, oh, sorry, we killed all your fish, and can you give us some more? <laughs> so uh, we know that just <coughs> transplanting these things, you know, going straight from one stream to the, you know, the source stream to the target stream, that's worked every time we've done it. And, uh, you know, we don't, we can't, magnify the number of fish like you can in a hatchery setting and produce more progeny, but, but it works. You know, we can just go take, you know, young of the year, sub-adults and adults and transplant them right into the stream and they know what to do from there. So that's probably what we'll, we'll do in that case. But in other cases where it wouldn't be so critical if, if we lost some at the hatchery, yeah, we can certainly use the Teleco hatchery and we've, we've uh, also been trying to produce some fish at uh, what, Buffalo Springs, Bobby, and, and the Irwin Hatchery as well. We're doing some work with, with wild fish, uh, native southern Appalachian fish in those as well. Are they, are they more fragile than, say, a rainbow? Uh, more fragile? I, I, I would say their habitat requirements are a little more, you know, a, a little more restrictive. They, they're going to require colder water, of yeah. course, than a, a little bit colder water than the, than the rainbows would require, yeah. Mm -hmm. So that's why you're typically going to find them in the headwater reaches and you've got rainbows farther, uh, farther downstream. Um, rainbows can probably tolerate up to 70 degrees or maybe a little more for short periods of time. I think that we wouldn't, you know, brook trout would not be able to handle water quite that warm. You showed the uh, access <clears throat> that you have to go 
it, it, are they easily fished in some areas or there's a much fishing pressure? Oh yeah, there's, I, that's gonna vary. A lot of our populations would not be what you would consider a destination fishery. I mean, it's, uh, if you really wanted to, you know, you could crawl through that rhododendron, you know, and, and stick a fly rod up through there and drop a dry fly on a pool. But uh, a lot of the streams, you would really have to wanna go there to fish them. Uh, but there are several, like Left Prong and Hampton Creek is probably the finest example. That's, that's in my opinion, the best brook trout stream we have in the state. There's no rhododendron or mountain laurel on that stream at all. It had been formally grazed. Their cattle had access to that, so you don't really have that rhododendron understory like most of the other streams. It's really wide open, and it has our highest brook trout abundance of, of any stream. So it would vary from that down to, like I say, something that's, a meter and a half wide and, and you'd have to be crawling around, you know, to get from, from one pool to the next. So it, it just varies. But there are plenty that, that certainly are fishable. And that are fished. Uh, and that are fished. A lot of them are just locally, you know, they're in terms of importance as a fishery, it would be local, you know, just the local anglers <coughs> would, uh, would know about them and fish them. A much smaller percentage would be something that would, you know, that would pull anglers in. And left prong is, is a great example. That's, like I say, it's fortunate that it's our best brook trout stream in terms of abundance. Um, it's, it's probably four to five times higher you know, than the statewide average. It's on a state natural area, that Hampton Cove natural area up near Roan Mountain, and very accessible, very easily fished, and it's a, it's a fantastic stream. As good as anything in the Smoky Mountains National Park, if not, if not better, really, in terms of you know, the size of the fish and the abundance. Any questions from the audience? Thank you very much. That was very informative and- You're very welcome, like thank you. Chairman McMillan, that concludes the Fisheries Committee. All right, at this time we're gonna to move to the Government Relations Committee and Vice Chairman Cannon. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, the committee recognizes Chris Richardson, Special Assistant to the Director on Policy and Legislation. Uh, I don't think he's had a busy season at all right now, do you? No, yeah. nothing going on at all. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, not a whole lot to update you on since the last meeting. The legislature is in full swing. Uh, bill filing deadline has passed. We know what universe we're dealing with. And right now, I'm pleased to say there's not a whole lot of bills that seem to directly impact the agency in any significant way. Uh, there are a number of bills that are filed that kind of deal with a lot of the things that, that come along with being a part of state government that we're monitoring. Um, as far as from a wildlife or a fishing, hunting fishing standpoint, uh, the, the bill that's been filed by Senator Bell and Representative Fogarty regarding wild hogs is the only piece of legislation uh, that, that we're really dealing with. Uh, currently. There's some other vessels out there that could be amended to uh, carry some changes, but I don't see that as being likely right now. Um, the most critical piece of legislation that y'all are probably concerned with is our sunset legislation. I can tell you it has moved through the Senate Government Operations Committee and passed out of Senate GovOp 9-0, and it is sitting in the calendar committee waiting to be put on the calendar and heard on the Senate floor. On the House side, uh, it has not been through the Government Operations Committee yet, but I'm hopeful that that bill is going to get placed on notice and run in the, in the coming weeks. Um, at the Memphis meeting, the Commission took action and asked us to send a letter to the Lieutenant Governor and the Speaker of the House regarding the changes that the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service did on our counting of permanent senior citizens license. The result of that letter uh, is a resolution that's been filed, uh, House Joint Resolution 667, which will be heard next week. Uh, hopefully the legislature will take the official action and urge the Fish and Wildlife Service to reconsider <coughs> the changes that they made or at the very least grandfather in the license holders that, were, that existed prior to the change. Um, with that, that, that basically is the status of, of all the critical pieces of legislation that that we're following now. We're obviously monitoring and watching several other pieces, but nothing uh, concrete to report to you at this time. Go ahead. 
Yeah, it's interesting. This is the second year of the General Assembly's two-year sessions. So they're in the neighborhood of 4,000 pieces of legislation that are currently filed and could be brought active, could be amended. Substantive language could, could be added to some of those in the form of the amendment that would affect us. But until those amendments are filed, we, we just monitor those, that, those bills that we know open captions that we're concerned with. That'd be my other caption bills that something could come up that we're not prepared for? Uh, I, I don't think there uh, would be any that we're not prepared for. We have a few of our own caption bills that we have placed there in the event that we need a change or somebody attempts to change something in a way. Um, we we'll just have to deal with, with any of those caption bills uh, on a on a case by case basis. But I've not been told that anything is coming down the pipe, and we're hopeful that it won't. Um, I do want to to mention this was a, a big week on the hill for the legislature or for the agency in front of the legislatures. We had uh, budget hearings in front of the House Agricultural Committee, the House Finance Committee, and the Senate Agricultural Committee. Director Carter and Assistant Director Sumners and Patrick and Ken Tarkington all came down to the Hill with me and, and we went through the, uh, through the process with them. All the he hearings went very well. We got favorable recommendations on our budget from all three committees um, and, and all the questions and concerns that the, that the members had were addressed very well. So with that, Mr. Chairman, if there's any questions, I'll be happy to. Chris, when I know this uh, legislative session is, is they're doing their best to end by a given date. They're fast tracking. Could you share that date with us? If if I was uh, putting my best guess on it, I would say the Thursday before Good Friday, which would be about a I believe April 17th is when they'll actually get done. They the legislature will will throw around the first week of April as their target, but I'm. I, while I'm confident that they're, they're working as hard as they can, I think it'll probably go to, to about mid-April. Director Carter, Chairman McMillan, is there anything, would you all like to add to this? I know you've, you've been making some visits to the Hill. Or if I could, one more thing that, that, that I will add that I've, I neglected to say with the appointment of uh, the new commissioner, Ms. King, and, and Commissioner Watson's confirmations will go through the legislature this session. The governor's office is handling those resolutions, preparing them, but I will assist in making sure that they have all the information they need. And certainly when, when the resolution gets going, uh, Commissioner Watson, if, if you need to be present, I'll let you know. That's great. Mr. Chairman, the only thing I would add is that I was very pleased with how the meetings this week went and the feedback that we got I thought was, was really good. So uh, while Chris is up there, I'm, be remiss if I didn't tell you there were any number of people who came by, the legislators and staff, who complimented Chris and how well he was working and how much they enjoyed having him down there. So uh, he's doing a really great job for us already and, and uh, proud to have him down there. Thank you, Director Chairman Miller. Anything? Thank you. And I, and I, I, would, I was getting ready to say the same thing. I even had comments from. Uh, uh, Speaker Rams yesterday about how awesome Chris was doing, how happy they were. So I know we don't like change and we miss that, but we're very tickled with the job you're doing. Appreciate your work. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Huh? I miss now. I'll tell you this now. Hey, turn it off. <laughs> All right, at this time we're going to move the Budget Committee. Chairman Jeff Griggs. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. At this time I'd like to call Tim Churchill, Chief. Real Estate Division, give us a report. Uh, Mr. Tim, I'm ready for you. Thank you, Commissioner Griggs. Uh, things are still moving along on a bunch of transactions that I've already uh, spoken about. Let me see if I can find my, I can't read any of it. <coughs> Strategic plan, okay. That looks right. Um, I didn't attempt to put all the transactions up that are in your books. I tried doing that one other time and that didn't work at all. So I've just got uh, my list and you've got your lists and there's, there's not much to uh, point out on these uh, other than the, uh, the Gerald Switch, uh, Carroll County uh, Stinson Track closed this past week 
the rest of them are still uh, going through process of, of being surveyed or, or uh, offers are out or, or people are uh, out appraising them. So there's a lot, of, a lot of real estate in the hopper right now, but uh, not a lot has closed in the last month or two. And we are working on a couple of new tracks, and this is this is uh, this tract is in Chester County. It's a uh, it's a wetland tract, and it's it's really a very good wetland tract. It's got a lot of it's got a lot of trees on it, and uh, it's I guess I can sort of I don't have a pointer or anything, but you can see up at the top here um, that's land that we bought fairly recently, and then right across the road, there's an outline of another track, and that's currently uh, in the process of being purchased as well. So this one is just, I guess, upstream. This is the uh, south fork of uh, the Fork of Deer River, and uh, it's it's uh, 125 acres. It's, it, it's from what the photos look like. It really looks like a, a, a good track, and it certainly was very wet so uh, uh, this is a, a new one to present to you and we're also working on uh, the directors working on uh, a deal with the uh, Department of Corrections on this very large tract here they they have never used this tract it's in Hickman County um, it's on the Duck River and well, it's, it's not quite to the Duck River but it's 1,500 acres, I, I believe, and uh, it's gonna be transferred to us uh, at no cost if everything works out. And so we will get this, and we're working with Tennessee Parks and Greenways Foundation to, to get this as well. This would take us right down to the, to the Duck River. Uh, Bill Reeves says that there's some shoals and stuff down here, so it, it would be good muscle habitat and a fantastic track for, for hunting. And uh, so this, this track here is the one that will actually uh, be submitting to SBC. This big track doesn't even have to go through SBC. It's just a transfer between departments. So uh, uh, those are the two that we've got going and this is another picture of it. You can see the collier tracks a little better down here, and then there's the big one up, up here from Corrections. But those are, that's about all the news that, that is news on the real estate front, if there's any questions. Uh, is there any questions for any of the commissioners? Uh, Mr. Chairman, Director Carter mentioned that there was a, uh, a map of the state that showed the uh, areas that you're trying to connect the dots. Yep. Is that something that you can put in our books or, or let us have access to? It's about this thick. We could send it out to you as a, uh, if it will email, it's it's a pretty big file, but it's, uh, it's, it's I thought statewide. Maybe it was just a map of the state that showed the areas that you're trying to connect. Well, I don't have that map, but we could probably work on a map like that. Too. All we see is they are these little things, and I'm sure sir. that this looks like it's by itself. Right. And if you, we could see where, what you're trying to connect, and I've, I've seen something similar to that in previous presentations, it makes more sense to, where, to what, what you're trying to do. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Okay. If it can be done. Sure. I'll look through other old stuff, too, and see if I can find something. Any more questions from the commission? Audience? Thank you, Tim. Uh, Mr. Chairman, I've got a question for Ed, mainly just a comment. Uh, you know, it was spoken about earlier about the emergency event that we had and that we had manpower that was out. Uh, on an event like that, from the budget standpoint, we do not see, receive any reimbursement if the state calls us out, but if the feds call us out, we get reimbursement, correct? We, we either get a portion or all of it. If it's a federal disaster, if it's state only, then we don't get any reimbursement. Okay, this comes out of our pocket. Yes, sir. Okay, thank you. Mr. Chairman? Director Carr, do you have any other things you want to 
address the commission about today? No, before you all leave, if you stop by the desk here, we have some information for you. Okay. All right. Any other business from the commission? Do you have something? All right. That's the case. We'll be adjourned tomorrow at 9 o'clock.